Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pause and Listen. Uh, glad to have you here. Our guest today is the author Dan Sewell, who you may have heard on my channel before, as I've done one of his stories earlier. Uh, I did Eternal Wonder, which is one of the coolest short stories I ever read. I really enjoyed that one. Uh, so welcome to the show, Dan. Thanks for having me, Brad. That's brilliant to be here. Absolutely. And uh, with me is Mary as well. Uh, Josie was unable to make it this week, uh, so it's just Mary and I interviewing Dan, but I think we should be able to get away with it. We do have a confession to make before we, we, we get started. Uh, we were relying on Josie to read the jam because Mary and I have both been working like dogs for the last month. So she, she read it and she gave us notes on it, but neither of us have managed to finish the book. I'm about a third of the way through it and I've been enjoying it. I just, I have no, t by the time I get home from work, I eat supper and then I fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I know your pain. So, yeah. so this week I was trying to read it on my lunch breaks at work, but I've been so busy at work. I, I, I only got one lunch break all week. <laughs> so <laughs> I haven't been able to finish it, but what I have read, I've really enjoyed. And I know, I don't, I don't know if Mary has gotten through much I've, of it either. I have started to read it. What I, what I've read so far, I enjoy, but I, I go to work and then I come home from work and I work again. Um, so <laughs> it is very difficult, but I was going through it and I, I think, I, I do think it's very interesting and I want to have time to be able to read it. <laughs> like, I, I want to be able to focus on this because this is this from what I've read so far, it looks like an amazing story. The, the writing style and everything on it is just, it's, it's very you, good. It's very good. It's impressive. Oh, I hope so. Well, sorry, go sorry, on. Go go ahead, on Brian. No, I was, I was just going to say, say <laughs> traffic jam, please go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say uh, it, that could make for a good interview, though, if you've just read a little bit of it and then you could, you know, there might be expectations that you've got of what's going to happen in the story. that might Absol not play Absolutely. Out. So, yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say to Mary that she should tell you what she does for a living because it's actually quite interesting. <laughs> ah, right. what I, you mean, do, I am a quality manager, so I work for a uh, 503B sterile compounding facility. I do like all the regulatory work. Um, I, I do like everything. <laughs> yeah. Right. But tell him who your boss is. is the oh, interesting part. oh, yeah. Uh, do you know who Mark Cuban is? No, no. Oh, <laughs> oh well, then it's not. Well, then it might be interesting then. <laughs> then it's um... not that much that interesting for you. <laughs> <laughs> but he has, so the, I will mention about, this will be my selfless, shameless plug. Uh, that the company I work for, so it's Mark Cuban Cost Plus Drug Company, and we are mm -hmm. providing a lower cost medication to people that can't afford it with that same quality behind it. So we're, you know, people maybe going through like chemotherapy or something, their mm. medications cost for them thousands of dollars, even with insurance. Uh, we've been able to reduce that cost significantly without them getting insurance. Um, oh, we've cool. saved people like maybe they're paying a thousand dollars for a medication and then they only pay like maybe forty dollars going through. Oh us. wow! We are That's yeah, we eliminate um some of the like PBMs, uh, pharmacy benefit managers that are you know in, in the middle of pharmacies that are really the ones that are uh, <clears throat> causing the price to go up. So we actually mm. cut that out for people so that they're getting that. We're just literally the cost plus shipping. And that's it. And yeah. we have all of that on the website very upfront. Um, it saves people that, I mean, life-saving medications that they need and making mm. sure they can live the rest of their life with money to actually do so without spending it all on their medicines. It's a very, uh, it's, it's a cause that lives very close to my heart. I'm, I'm yeah, very passionate well. about what I do. <laughs> yeah. Mine as well, being how much medication I have to take being schizophrenic, it's very expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bet, yeah. I bet. Yeah, we, we don't obviously have that problem in the UK. <laughs> no, you guys are lucky. I yes, mean, we have lucky. socialized medicine here as well, yes. but like you guys only pay a, a set amount per prescription as far as I know, don't you? That's where, and you wouldn't pay for schizophrenic medication. You wouldn't pay for uh, medication for leukemia or anything like that. You would, it would only be for like antibiotics or... Um, you know, I don't know if you needed a cream for something <laughs> like you had an itch. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you guys well, you got pay... socialized medicine, right? That's right. Yeah. Well, it has its problems. And at the moment, there's lots of strikes because it's been run down. But yeah, you don't. You, it's free on the point of delivery. 
for for most people mm. and uh, for lots of stuff. So yeah, we are very lucky because you always see people on online. Like I mean, Laird Hamilton had that health scare in America, didn't he, a few months ago? Yeah, I, I mean, everyone for, around. For comparison, um, maybe 10, 12 years ago, I waited eight months for emergency surgery, eight to 10 months, somewhere in there for emergency surgery. That's how bad our socialized medicine is. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. what my company does is we're kind of um, getting closer to so people aren't spending all of their money they go to work for on medications they need to live because that's that's no way to live. And we're also no, providing medications that are on FDA shortage as mm -hmm. well for customers so that they can get their life-saving medications so they don't have yeah. to wait that long for surgeries and stuff it's yeah it's one of those things isn't it it's where it's like no one chooses their health really you exactly know? you just it is what it is and and it shouldn't be something that like potentially cripples you financially or in your entire family yeah, so, yeah we do, I feel, always... do feel lucky in the uk yeah i always say i i uh I may have been dealt a shittier hand than a lot of people were, but I, I'm just trying to pull the, the winning cards like everybody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully play the hand you got. some people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like a great business. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's amazing. I, I love working for a company that actually supports their mission fully. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of companies that like, they'll say that, oh yeah, no, we're totally going to do this. And then behind the scenes they are like, nah, we're going to make money and charge people a bunch mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And we don't care, but it's really lovely seeing even the CEO that I work for, Alex, he is very passionate about that goal and will make sure that we do everything that we can to one, make sure the quality is correct for people. We don't skip corners. I'm very by the book. I'm very about regulatory stuff. I, I will do everything in my power to make sure that whoever gets these medications, nothing is going to go bad for them. I will do every possible check on my side to make sure we are doing it correctly for them. Mm, it's, mm. it's very important to me. I've spent most of my life working in this industry and it's, it's hard to find a company that is this passionate as I am about it. And it's amazing. It's, <clears throat> it makes my life a lot easier to work for somebody like this. It's yeah, more motivated, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. On, on, the, on this <laughs> side of the pond, Mark Cuban is a very famous man. He owns the Miami Heat basketball team, and uh, he's oh, on the, the Dragons. The Mavericks. Yeah. The Mavs. Is it the Mavs? The Mavs? I thought it was the we... Miami Heat. Oh no, it's the Mavericks. And the only reason I know is because I because I'm in the I work out of the same facility as them for right now until oh, we get that's... the facility fully built up. So that's why I very know. Cool. I'm not a basketball fan, so I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm not either. That's why I, th I guess I thought it was the Miami Heat, but he's also on the show Dragons Den. And uh, uh, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, we do. Uh, and, yeah, uh, I would maybe have seen Shark him Tank. from that. Mm -hmm. Shark Tank as well. He's Shark there. Shark Tank is what I meant to say. Sorry, <laughs> not Dragons Den is the Canadian version of Shark Tank. I just had a uh, mental lapse. Yeah, it's all good. Call, it's all good. And we call it Dragons Den as well in the UK. Yeah, I've seen your version of it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, tell I... us about. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say you were talking about basketball even further behind that on the UK because no one watches oh, basketball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the same in it's the same in Canada. We've got like one team and nobody really cares. Yeah. Um. Anyway, tell us about Dan Sewell. How did you get into writing? What's what, How did you get into it? And how did you turn your passion into a career? Yes, the real reason we are here is to talk about you. <laughs> yeah. Please. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, uh, do you want the, 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 the slightly longer version or the shorter version? No, the tell, us, version. tell us the long version. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to hear the details. Okay. So the, the longer version would be, as a, as a kid, I was... Um, very very dyslexic and probably kind of illiterate until i was about 12 or so um but i had a mother that was um an english teacher of high school you would call it a high school english teacher i think um and in the end she was a headmistress and stuff and r ran the high schools and stuff but um so i kind of and my dad trained as a history teacher uh but he's a he's a potter and that's just just to say the kind of context of it was it's like i was rubbish at reading but <laughs> We always went to plays <laughs> and we always talked about movies and theater and books and stuff like that. And my house was filled mm. with books. I just 
couldn't read them. They were like these, I have this memory. My mum had a, a kind of room in the middle of the house. It was her office. And literally it was just, it was a big room, but just one wall was all just books from floor to ceiling, um, wall to wall. And I just remember like standing in front of it as a little child, like kind of thinking, oh, I, I wish I could read what was in those things and get Aww. the, get, Aww. get the meaning out meaning out of them but my mum used to read to me she was like because she was a, used to teach drama as well she was a wonderful actress and would do all the voices and things like that and um so I, I suppose I always kind of had a a little passion for that but I really struggled with um reading and writing uh probably until I was getting into my teens like you know even when I could read I was terrible I would have a kind of reading age four years younger than my actual high school age but I had right. like a working a working vocabulary four years ahead of my actual age as well. So it was kind of quite difficult because it was a big Yeah, that's quite the juxtaposition. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, it was a kind of like a story at high school where I would have to go to the remedial class. Um, they called it special needs back in the 90s. So, ah, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. Right, where, where, where everyone that like for lots of different reasons had to go to that class and, and it was... Um, yeah a bit humiliating not because of being with those people just because you know obviously people will make fun of you for that and um right. I just remember we had a meeting with my mum and myself had a meeting with the kind of the head my head of year and English um teachers as well and said they wouldn't let me do the exam because I'd bring the grade down to the school oh. and it was a good school wow oh. yeah That's yeah so bullshit. I see it yeah it's bullshit so but in, my mum's a bit of a fire uh <laughs> you know a bit of a dragon and she was an English teacher herself and she knew all the rules and she was just like well you've got to let him fail you know and if you don't get let him try how do you know you're just assuming he's going to fail right. and I go but he will and blah, it would not help his confidence and she's like well let me worry about that and anyway I did it and I did really well so <laughs> hell, <laughs> so yeah. Screw them. hell yeah and, yeah sure exactly. well. so I kind of went through and and went to university and I studied uh, English and linguistics at university and then I did a PhD in English and linguistics and my PhD was all about kind of national identity and political storytelling um oh I didn't realize you had your doctorate wow that's impressive yeah yeah there's of course certificates behind (laughs) just to remind me just to remind me uh yeah and um it's like Ross Geller in Friends, you know, like not a real doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, it's um, it's real. It's real to me. It's, it's real. Yeah, what absolutely. What you had to go through to get yeah. to that. See, that the is, effort yeah, so, to achieve that. Yeah, wow. You're definitely yeah, so a doctor. It was, it, it's kind of ironic um, that I end up, ended up there. So just kind of by accident, my PhD ended up being a lot about kind of natural storytelling and political storytelling. Um and, and about national identity and stuff like that. And it all kind of links together in, in various ways. And then after my PhD, uh, I went on to be an academic for about seven and a half years. I worked in Scottish universities. It was, what I think you would call it an associate professor over the past. Okay. We would call it a lecturer, junior lecturer. And uh, yeah, I taught in graduate schools. And it was kind of funny at the end of my PhD, I started teaching writing to other PhD researchers. And like the business I run now is I've been a freelance academic for about 10 years now, getting on for 11 years. And I kind of teach all over Britain and Ireland. And I go to Norway. I've taught at the University of Greenland. Um, Wow. And uh, I teach research writers. I teach PhD researchers and research staff how to write better research papers and finish their PhDs and uh, a bit about how to supervise PhDs and things like that. So that's um, super impressive. Yeah. that's kind of my thank you <laughs> so that's my business and it's very fun because I, I only work two and a half days a week <laughs> oh that's nice i want that really good you think you've got a good job mary i only work two and a half days a week <laughs> so i was like i, I always tell that, that to people so that they ha- so that they hate me <laughs> and oh, uh, the other two look, are, oh. <laughs> i got people that hate me too because i'm the quality side of things i gotta come down and be like look you guys can't do this we gotta change yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotta do a better job yeah. Uh, yeah so and then the other two and a half days I, I look after my kids and I, and I get to write my books and stuff so I kind of uh, got in I was writing you know PhD and I wrote a research book after that about politics and identity and some research papers and stuff so I was a kind of published academic um, but then I quit my glamorous academic job because we wanted to move from Scotland where we live 
to back to Northern Ireland, where my wife is from, mm -hmm. and uh, and to bring the kids back here and stuff. And so I said, well, she's a clinical psychologist, right? So she has like a really important job, and she got she got a really good job over here to work full time. So <clears throat> I said I would just run my little kind of side business and look after the kids, and the side business grew, and you know we had another child and stuff and I kind of had a bit more spare time and I thought what will I do with my spare time and I thought well I've always wanted to write so this was about 10 years ago and um so I started writing short stories because I thought of oh, why not try and teach myself how to, how to write short stories and that grew yeah. and grew and grew and um yeah I think about four or five years ago I started kind of work on five, five years ago I started trying to write novels and failing quite a bit and then, <laughs> like third time third time round, I, I wrote a book called near Livica. and then you know since then i've had about five novels out and the, the last one of which was the the jam that we were talking about um yeah and i'm currently writing too many novels and i should probably focus on one and finish it <laughs> <laughs> i i am scatterbrained where i need to focus on like multiple things at one time so uh -huh. i understand that <laughs> yeah yeah well, I had, I, I said to you earlier, I got COVID and uh, about a year and a half ago and uh, I got really bad brain fog after it and I could just about do my work. <laughs> I was forgetting things all the time. Mm -hmm. And I started about five novels uh, over that year because I would normally write about two books a year. And mm. uh, I kind of started them and I would write anywhere between 10,000 and 30,000 words in them. And then I just kind of lose the thread. I couldn't it's like the writing wasn't bad and I, I, I like the story ideas, but I couldn't keep all the plates spinning and yeah, track where I was going. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And that seems to be ebbing off a little bit now. So I'm kind of two thirds of the way through one of these novels. It's quite big and uh, about a third of the way through another. So, but I should just focus on one. That was very good. <laughs> hey, you do whatever I, you need to do. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's, that's the kind of long, longer version of it, I suppose. Um, I grew up in, Another kind of side version of it is I grew up in the hometown of where the poet Lord Byron had his home seat and um, uh, it was the town nearest to that and it's the, yeah, it's a beautiful little cathedral town in the, um, uh, yeah, in the, in the middle of England, in the kind of, near Sherwood Forest where um, uh, Robin Hood's from. Robin ah, Hood, yeah. yes. <laughs> and I reference it in most of my books I think yeah it's referenced in the jam I think because I don't know if you've got to the bit where the footballers going up they, he's going up the M1 and there's the, the premiership footballers heading up north to see his girlfriends yeah um yeah well he's heading there that's where he's going oh <laughs> very so cool I, yeah so I always have little links between the novels they're not they're not a series but there are little easter eggs that link or refer to something in the other books right just, yeah. the same way king does that's very yep. cool Good like a you. multiverse beginning i love that yeah that kind of idea <laughs> yeah that's really neat so tell us about the jam what was the inspiration behind the jam <clears throat> well brad i was drunk one night and <laughs> <laughs> Some years ago, and I was I was driving. This is before we had kids, but we still lived in Scotland, and we were driving home from seeing friends. And I think my wife might have been pregnant, actually, hence why I was drunk and she was driving. <laughs> and I was I was I was nicely merry, and we were driving down the motorway, and it was night, and there was the kind of you know the the kind of lights overhead, and and it just popped into my head that like wouldn't wouldn't a motorway be a really good place to have a horror story? because it's kind of, and this is even really before I'd started writing short stories, and I just thought, oh God, a motorway is a really good setting for a story because they're kind of strange places that they are, they're between places, really. They're kind of yeah. liminal places. I started the book saying that they're neither here nor there, you know, and someone's going from somewhere, some particular somewhere to another particular somewhere, right? there, And, um, but what would, you know, you've been, we've all sat in traffic jams, and everyone just stays in a car and you can't go anywhere and if it's in the middle of nowhere which is a little harder in the uk but we do have open stretches of countryside right <laughs> uh, but if it's, in, if it's in canada or america you could genuinely be like you know oh yeah but miles away from everywhere if i broke down on a highway but i just like the idea of like all the cars are crammed together 
and you're kind of shut in. So even if you wanted to move your car, you couldn't. And then it's just countryside for the far as the eye can see. And there's, you know, you could be quite unfamiliar with where you are. Um, and I just thought, oh, that's quite an interesting place to trap people. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And I kind of wrote it in a notebook and then I came back to it. And I'd, I'd kind of continually come back to the idea over the years, just thinking, oh, I could write a story about that. And then, yeah, that's kind of where, what germination was, just the idea that a, a traffic jam is a great a great place to set a, 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 um, a horror story. And, you know, then you can always have the pun that, you know, traffic is literally hell. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, actually. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we don't get too much traffic where I live. I, I, I am in the middle of nowhere, in fact. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Way out in the countryside in the prairies. There's only 500 people, 545 people in my town, 550, something like that. Wow, that is small. Yeah, I live on a yeah, little peninsula. Um, so I there's, have... a, there's a. Go on. There's a, there's a lock on one side and a lock on the other side, but I think there's the peninsula is about eight miles long. There's only a couple of thousand people on the whole peninsula. So. Oh, wow. Not so quiet. <laughs> Yeah, we have my province of Saskatchewan. Uh, I, I, I think I said so in my Saskatchewan Skinwalker video, but it, it's mm. 652,000 square kilometers and there's only a million people in the whole province. Oh, wow. So it's like it's basically <laughs> empty. I don't know yeah. what that is in, in American, Mary, but it, it means empty. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was, so correct me if I'm wrong, because I, so like I said, I've only read a small portion, but I, I was kind of mm. trying to skim through it a little bit to have a little bit more of an idea of the story, but it looks like that you're doing it from different points of view of different people in their cars. Um, mm. And I, and I, if that is true, I, I think that's very, an interesting concept because there are, you know, like you were saying in a traffic jam, yeah, you don't know what's going on in other people, mm. in other people's lives, what they're talking about, what's mm-hmm. happening, where they're going. And I thought mm. that's a cool concept. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, thanks. It, yeah. That, that was the idea. It was also another, like a, a kind of convenient, well, a traffic jam again, like you said, it, it's a, a legitimate excuse to put a bunch of people that normally wouldn't be together together, mm. you know, seemingly by accident, they are all, you know, so in the in the story, there's a premiership football player. Um, there's an internet marketing guru slash shyster uh, <laughs> who's, who's fun to write. There's a family that seems a bit dodgy, like the, <laughs> something's not right with the, this mother and father and son. And the father's made them go on a in a camper van right. on a, on a yeah. impromptu road trip. Who else is there? Um, uh yeah there's a kind of someone who might be a prostitute um hitching a ride um with a seemingly very nice old doctor um <laughs> and yeah i don't know if you've got to vickers and cordelia yet there's a couple of other people that turn up later on i haven't got that far yet but yeah, everybody else yeah. you've mentioned i'm familiar with yeah so and then the whole point of it isn't no one is as they seem you know or no one is quite as they're they're projecting to be and then you know the start of the book is you know each i think the first three or four chapters is like um different people's points of view they're driving their cars right. and they're all kind of driving away from something or towards something and um then the traffic jam stops and they all kind of come to a halt breaking hard um and then yeah they're trapped there and then some other things start to happen and then they're kind of wondering what's causing the traffic jam because again in a traffic jam you can't you can only see so far and yeah. then you're assuming and all the radios are off and um no one's mobile phone is working and so it's quite confusing so people start getting out of their cars um which, yes i've been waiting to find out why that is i haven't gotten that far yet yes <laughs> I've only skimmed to that portion when people are like confused and stuff because I don't want to ruin the story for me because I do want to go back and fully read it because it does mm-hmm. seem very interesting. So I'm like, all right, I don't want to skim too far to get too much information because then I'll ruin it for myself. Yeah. 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 Where well, do you think you don't want to where do, have you got any guesses where you think it's going? I've none yet. I haven't gotten that far. Yeah. I I don't have 
any guesses um what i might do if this is okay is when i'm yeah. reading it i might send you my guesses on twitter as i'm reading it and then, oh, yeah do it that'd be fun yeah yeah <laughs> see where you go yeah 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 i love trying to guess where stories are going like stories movies all that stuff i love trying to figure it out as i'm going through it to see like if if i'm on the right track or if i'm totally wrong and then you threw me off the loop which i also love so i'm okay with either way of being right or being totally wrong but i think it'll be fun yeah. to do that for yeah. it. okay cool uh let me know what you think of the doll when you find when you come to her as well Oh, there's a doll oh okay. <laughs> yeah, there's sort of a, a doll do the same. that turns up yeah it's um i'll, do the same. I'll keep you posted on my progress <laughs> we could have a read along yeah i, I kind of wanted the idea that um, you know you got all these people together and they wouldn't normally form alliances and then they're obviously in a in the kind of uh pressure cooker of what's going on um but it it's difficult to talk about the book without spoilers because yeah <laughs> the, whole point, sure. the whole point is you think one thing is happening and then you think another thing is happening um but another idea behind the story was particularly from the family, because even though it's an ensemble piece, I would say more of what it is, is it's Max's story, the young boy and the, and his mum. So and they're in a kind of, uh, you know, there's a kind of trigger warning for anyone. There is a kind of like domestic abuse element to the. To the yeah, story. I, so, I gathered that just from the yeah. very brief introduction I've read of them. It, it definitely yeah. seemed like that's where that was headed. So, yeah. And, and there's not lots of you know, explicit descriptions about that element of it, but it is referred to. So it's just always make people aware of stuff like that. But it's really right. their story about that that kind of triad and this kind of through line is about is about those um I always think of it as like they're they're the kind of heart of the story and the other people are really important, but like um and they've all got their own I always like the the thing as a story, you know, the movie, the thing. I've got a post <laughs> <laughs> and I love how that's an ensemble cast and they've all got their own motivations. Um, but, you know, you do have a central character in it that's kind of driving the action. So, I actually like that you put something. Um, I haven't gotten to this part yet, but you're, you know, you're saying the trigger warning about the domestic mm. abuse and stuff. And I always think it's really interesting and shows a lot of how you are as a writer being able to put stuff like that into your stories and being able to add that element to it because obviously you know uh i'm sure that you don't live this life <laughs> but being able to put yourself outside of that and under yeah, exactly. and add that concept into a story i think is great mm. writing and i think it's it shows how impressive you are and how far you've come as well a right and and being able to to write different perspectives and have them seem like completely different people instead yes. of all of you know like seems sort of the same that's yeah. i don't know that i could do that well so yeah i i oh, really you. like your writing style oh thank you i, I mean i think it's a it's a kind of it's a, a bit of a hot topic at the moment i suppose on well on twitter so i don't know whether it's really a hot topic but we chat about it. <laughs> people people talk about it on twitter don't they and I, I suppose on one extreme people talk about cultural appropriation and there's, mm. there's that element of it and then the other side is like you know you can't you can't write this perspective or you can't write that perspective some people believe that obviously um yeah. the other that i think you can or you should, like writing should be empathetic mm -hmm. like if you're doing it absolutely empathy is the heart of of writing and uh, of telling stories and i think if you said oh dan you can't write someone from a um this perspective or that perspective that kind of background i'd be a bit like well you know, like it's impossible. You couldn't ever represent their experience as a life. I would say, well, that that's a, kind of a sad world that's not got any empathy in it. Right. It's almost like a kind of, well, maybe the worst kind of dystopia. That if if you're saying that there's no empathy, but I do think there is a legitimate thing about, you know, that it's possible to like culturally appropriate something or to make mm. a crap crap job of oh, writing yeah. from someone's point of view and i think that kind of comes out <laughs> yeah, it's like absolutely. no you know i just did a bad job at it. <laughs> it's not it's not that i appropriated the point of view it's just that i was rubbish at doing it <laughs> you, know, you know i didn't do my research or didn't um 
try to get inside their head enough and think from their their right. point of view yeah and again some of that i think is research and familiarity and so the, i can i can well imagine there are certain types of character i probably would think twice about trying to represent just because maybe that i don't have anyone in my life that i can kind of think about and go oh you know could it could i really do that um or you know i'd have to go to the library and read a lot <laughs> you know, yeah. or something like that go watch yeah. good movies and, and and things like that um but yeah empathy i, would I think, think it's quite important i think as long as you have the like you're saying the research and you have those good intentions of what you're trying to do i think it's mm. important to add that into stories because there's people that are living lives with those type of situations involved and it also opens up more readers eyes when they are exposed to those types of situations i mm. and this is going to be a uh this is going to be a <laughs> maybe a hot topic but um i i think it's good to expose people to those types of situations and not kind of wash everything oh everything's clean yeah, you, clean because yeah i mean they need to have that type of perspective in their lives to understand why they should maybe care about you know maybe for example like you're saying like the domestic abuse why they should care about those types of situations and i i think it's important to include those in stories so i i'm i makes me more excited to go through the story and read it now to with mm. that kind of in mind mm. and stuff you are putting those different perspectives in there yeah, yeah. i mean i hope so. Yeah. i hope so like because otherwise where are the stakes where are the emotional stakes if everyone exactly. is like oh i'm pretty happy and sort it out you're like where's the emotional growth <laughs> and yeah. like, not, that every, <laughs> not that every chapter needs emotional growth you know i mean stephen king the greatest of us all oh man quite a lot of his not all, but quite a lot of his characters don't go through check, don't emotionally change through a story. Right, right, right. There's oh, the, and he, how, how many times has Stephen King written a plot twist oh. that's based that's based <laughs> on a character revelation? Probably never. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's still like you know, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's um, but uh, you know, not that his, he doesn't have emotional growth, but his his characters were already very very fleshed out and stuff. It's just his he's very he's also so he manages to do a kind of cool trick where it's like re, I think like lots of layers to character. Yes. Um, but he doesn't necessarily always tether the, the the need for a character change to plot, right? Like there's the plot and there's the people going through the plots, mm -hmm. and they're already rich and, and full character, but they're you know they're not necessarily trying to uncover um like an emotional flaw i mean again i can think of some and i'm talking it through like some counter examples but even if i think about the shining right you could mm -hmm. argue it's kind of an interesting one with the shining like danny who who really i suppose is the hero of the piece right yes. right doesn't go through any emotional change right any psychological growth like he's 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 a good boy at the start and he's a good boy at the end right right yes he is who he is his dad sort of does and i suppose like there's a there's a kind of bit with kubrick where kubrick mate obviously did his version of the shining and king never liked it and just and, and yeah. said like well um jack's already mad when he goes but I think you can kind of read The Shining and go, Jack is already mad before he goes. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes. Like he's, I've, he's I've read both the it. book and I've seen the yeah. movie, so I completely understand. <laughs> you know, and I, I get it. Like, you know, Jack Nicholson is really in your face with the performance and he already oh, yes. seems a little bit. But I was kind of like, I thought in a way, I was like, oh, I can't kind of nailed it <laughs> oh yeah like it's, it's over the top but it's over the top in the best way possible like it's yeah yeah it's it's like tim yeah. curry in uh in the original it movie like it's it's oh, way over uh, the top oh, but it's, yeah yeah but it's yeah. brilliant hello georgie <laughs> <laughs> we all float down here yeah uh, one of them. i <laughs> love stephen king and i've read all of those stories i will have to say i I did like the book better than the movie, though, for The Shining. I did. Oh, I did I, like it better. I do see what you're saying. I agree. Though. I, do see I agree. Saying. No, I think the book is a lot better. The thing I also think really that what's really great about the book is that um, Jack's not a nice man, but you still have yeah. lots of sympathy for him. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, that you, is you, that you is know, a weird sort of dichotomy, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And you don't get, I suppose, in the movie, one 
Holleran doesn't survive in the movie, does he? But he does in the book, and it's quite important because otherwise you can't have Doctor Sleep. And Correct. Then, yes. Oh, yes. And, yeah. <laughs> and and then like you don't quite get the same slow build of the of the way that the hotel kind of gets inside um, Jack's head. Yeah. Which I thought was just mm. that's you know, and it, that's a bit kind of like oh, it's just here, and then it arrives, and then there's you know. The yeah, kind in of the movie it just sort of happens. Out. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and you don't get the the topiary animals. You know, <laughs> oh yeah, yes. Danny, they're yes. not in yeah. the movie. Oh, and they were like yeah, one of the best was, bits. And yeah, yeah. that was a shame. Well, they change like out, little details, like the things that he uses to like break down the door and stuff. Like they're there. I I notice all these little details because I I do feel like they even though they seem like so small, I do think they're important to like. The whole the story in a whole. Oh yeah, <laughs> King does that so well though, doesn't he? Like he has like these little repeating loops where he'll bring in the rope mallet, and mm-hmm. um, and uh, or the um, the fire hose as well is another good one, isn't it? <laughs> that, yeah. that, that Danny thinks is a snake and it keeps coming yeah. alive and stuff, and they're topiary animals, and he has these little things there, and the boiler as well. Oh like, the yeah, boiler's yeah. A, oh yeah, the boiler. Big part the boiler, of the book so huge yeah and it's literally like a good ticking time bomb but it's not in the movie so <laughs> yeah it takes a lot of that out but i mm. oh, oh king is amazing but you're you're also doing a phenomenal job from what i've read so far and the way that you're talking about your story and stuff i've this gets me more excited to go through and read it and send you messages <laughs> about what i think is going to happen <laughs> thank you yeah, i'm thanks. i and i'm in the middle of redoing eternal wonder the only problem Ooh. with that is when I when I started redoing it, I started redoing it with a full cast, but I had mm. just I had just restarted my course of medication for my schizophrenia, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I'm I'm a little bit lost on who I asked to do what, and I'm still trying to figure that out. Does that change your <laughs> voice at all, Brad? How Does do you it mean? Change your voices. Well. Your voice, because it maybe like your voice now sounds a little bit different than your story voice. Yeah, well, I used to edit it just a little bit lower, and I I mm. don't do that anymore. Um, mm. But but I my narration voice I agree is different than my regular conversational voice anyway. Um, but yeah, I used I used to edit it just a little bit lower because uh, mm. I thought it sounded better but I, I figured out how to make it more more clear and add more bass to it without um, editing my voice lower pitching it lower than it needed to be so would, would you post-production lower it or would that be something that you do as that's you what know, I like, that's what I used thing. to do <clears throat> I used to do post-production lowering and then now I I use just a a, a bass boost and a and an equalizer to sort of mm. smooth it out and make it sound uh, louder and deeper. Mm. Well, I love that reading of the story. It's great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's it's always nice to hear from an author that they liked mm-hmm. what you did with their work. Mm-hmm. Were, you doing some, were you doing something with Richard Chismar as well? <gasps> I, yes. did, I did do <laughs> a Richard like, yes. Chismar <laughs> <laughs> I did do a Richard Chismar story, which is probably as close as I'm ever going to get to doing something with Stephen King. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did a story of his called The Tower, which which was really cool. Uh, and I'm also my other big project that I'm in the middle of right now is a story with his with his son, Billy. Um, mm. uh, what is it called? Phantom Rain. And I'm in the middle of doing that one. Um, but I'm redoing that from my original recording because um, I decided to add another cast member. So I have to redo that one as well. Mm-hmm. So, but my, like I said, my new job, I've been there for a month and it just, it takes everything out of me. I come home and I mm-hmm. eat supper and then I fall asleep on the couch. It, it's a, it's a very, very physically demanding job. Mm-hmm. And I just, I, I've found I haven't had the time or focus for anything else. I'm just exhausted. Mm-hmm. So, so I like even putting out short YouTube videos right now has been a struggle for me. Mm-hmm. Well, I've noticed that you do um, a bunch of short stories and I, I'm actually going to go through and probably read all of them because I also voice act for Brad as well, occasionally mm. for different stories and stuff. So she does. I'm interested in doing that more, <laughs> especially on your work. Um, but I, I did notice that you provide those stories for free. 
I was looking mm-hmm. at your Twitter and I saw that and I was and I was I was kind of curious yeah, quite on a few why free you ones. chose that. <laughs> mm. Um well you can buy them as paperbacks as well. <laughs> and, okay, and, okay, and, okay. That's good to and, know. And they, and they are like on so I, I kind of package them up in different ways. Um I did a lot of short stories. I haven't written a short story in a in a wee while now. Um but what, what I did was I, I use a lot of short stories to kind of like practice craft or sometimes you just get an idea that's a good length for a short story. Um, if, and sometimes I get a short story idea that then becomes a novel, like my book Witch Hopper, which is like 150,000 word, big, beefy, um, kind of epic folk story. It started off as a short story um, that's, right. that's out there. But um uh, so I kind of do them as singles, so they're just ninety-nine cent singles as a way of like oh, hopefully wow. people see them, and occasionally I can you know can put them on free on Amazon every, twice a year, and that way people can just kind of try before you buy if you like, like see see if do I like this author, um, and then I've got them as a couple of anthologies that you can buy on uh, online as well, but uh, paperbacks or as ebooks. Um, You've also got a book or it, two on Scribed as well, yeah. I think Do I've I? read some work of yours of Scribed, yeah. Oh, I might have um, those those ones on Scribed, yeah. Tooth, tooth and, and Claw? Is yeah, that, yeah, so that's right? That's, yeah. A, that's right. Tooth and Claw, maybe uh, Night Terrors. So just two collections of, I think, about eight or nine stories. Um, and then if you sign up to my newsletter, you get those two anthologies for free off, off my newsletter, plus um, uh, Dracula, Jacqueline and Hyde, and Frankenstein as a kind of oh. big ebook, yeah, because they're That's out of copyright. Really so, <laughs> <I just laughs> yeah. them up. public so, domain um, now, yeah, public domain, yeah. So I just, um, it's a way of bringing people in, hopefully, to see my writing and and things like that. But um, one oh. you might like, Mary, is because it's a, a female protagonist that would shoot your voice for. It's called Inheritance. So it's about a a, do- a daughter who's trying to sell. A dead father's car but the dead is she's just got it back from the police because he was an infamous serial killer oh and she can't oh she wow, can't, that sounds like yeah. a cool story so oh, she yeah. can't get she can't get rid of this damn car because most people that want to buy it either just are weirdos you know <laughs> they just they yeah. want to meet her and they want to meet, <laughs> yeah, have a bit of paraphernalia uh but she's desperate for the money and her mom's kind of falling apart and isn't really with us very much mentally anymore because she's just struggling with with what's happened and then she's obviously got these fond memories of actually being in the back of this car it's like one of those old jaguar cars you know the kind of oh yeah her dad was really proud of and she just has memories of being in the back and going on these long drives with him and falling asleep um anyway so that's the premise of the story and again there's there's a twist in there but it's from her point of view so she's kind of like in a in her 20s and just She's trying to get rid of this damn car, um, and so she's off to off to meet someone who seems like a genuine seller, a genuine buyer for the first time. Oh, okay. It's called or inheritance. It isn't. It's called inheritance. Yeah. I wrote it but, down so I would remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, it sounds good, and even if like, um, uh, I just I probably would just want to read it, and then somehow if we got your permission and Brad was up to it, yeah, I'd be like, Brad. You'd be more than more than welcome to do it. Yeah. <laughs> There's oh, a male I'd love part to have it. you back on. There's a male part in it as well that Brad could do. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah. 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 No, I'd love to do more more of your stories and I'd love to have you back on the show again in the future. Oh, you'd be welcome to, yeah. So yeah, is it just I, a way to like get readers, I guess, more um, familiar with your work? Kind of like a, get them on board so that you, because you do, you said you do sell paperbacks and such for your work as well? I yeah, yeah. One, so, <laughs> yeah so yeah that's exactly what it is I, I kind of originally did them as well most of them are published in were published in magazines so various some of them are now defunct but like little horror zines like Disturbed Digest and Sanitarium and oh. Evolution Z which was a good Canadian horror uh, magazine that was going for a while but then uh, folded a few years ago um, so they, most of them have been out there and kind of were in fee paying markets and then you get the copyright back after a little while so I just thought I then use them as an anthology and I kind of get 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 people out there as a kind of call it a reader magnet I think they call it yeah um, so people sign up to yeah are you so it works quite well 
I think it'd be good too if you're able to provide Brad with links to your work so people can go and if they want to purchase them or something so that he can add it to the video that would be great <laughs> oh yeah no I do that I um on eternal wonder I've got his author page on Amazon okay, perfect. <laughs> I just, just want to make sure you know. yeah oh absolutely I'm all about crediting who, people that I work with oh yeah especially yeah especially when they're like really good authors with a lot of work to to read through like Dan yeah so what kind of what would your kind of big um archetypal like epic story that you would go to for a read reread uh oh the dark tower series by king i've i've okay. read it probably three or four times already and I, I i could read it again without a problem it's it, absolutely his magnum opus it, it's an incredible read I read the um, I read the first one, and I didn't carry on. <laughs> oh, that's that's such a shame. It that, gets yeah, so and, good, and that's what I've heard. I was like, no, everyone, you, you've got to you got to read you got to read on. Um, you do. Like, oh, okay. I have actually. So he's actually my favorite author, Stephen King, and I am mm. going through reading all of his books in order that he wrote them. Uh, Ooh, but I am. Fun refusing to read the dark tower series until i've finished all the books because there's um, so many different because I've, I've heard so many different times that's what pulls all of the multiverse together it, it so is I make sure i'm not missing anything because i'm what? i'm huge on books that tie into each other even if it's just like a little slither of something that you were you were mentioning doing in your books which makes me excited to read them as well i love i love <laughs> finding those little things in there that connect other stories that the author has written i love seeing that stuff yeah yeah i uh you know i need to read the rest of the dot towers i know i do i finished firestarter this morning firestarter okay. was a good book yeah i read that one over 100 love, years ago but yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book yeah it's a really really good book and then what am i reading i'm reading um uh summer of night dan simmons oh yeah that's, that's good yeah that's really good I've, as well. I've I've never read any Dan Simmons, but I'm familiar at least. You've never read The Terror? No. Oh my god, maybe my favorite horror book of ever. Ever. You said The anyone. Terror? I'm writing this down right now. The Terror. <laughs> yeah. Oh, The Terror is like other another level. It's um Yeah, it's just phenomenal. It's based on the terror the lost strips of the terror and the Erebus. Oh. Um, which were two British Royal Navy ships that were trying to find the Northwest Passage um, through uh, Canada, well, basically through Canada and Greenland, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Prince William, well, it's called Prince William Island now, right? But they used to call it Prince William Land because they didn't know it was because it was all under um, ice. And so famously, they were lost and no one knew what happened to them. And um, there was a, a kind of marker, a cairn, that they left and said, we're here, we're camped, um, we're running low on rations. And then when rescue missions were sent to find them, they weren't where they were supposed to be. And the local Inuit tribes <clears throat> all said, you're looking in the wrong place. They've Because they've got great oral history. They told stories of these crazy guys um, who ended up, eating each other oh wow so they commit so they, they found them but by the by the time the local tribes had found them they were mad living out on the ice and eating each other and they tried to show them how to kill seals and give them seal meat and they chased them off with their guns and knives and stuff um so the inuits were like they're not there the ships aren't there they're in these other places but no one believed them for centuries because they were inuits right and the, mm. the prejudice of it all but what Dan Simmons did, and a lot of people find Dan Simmons problematic because he's become a bit of a grumpy old man, apparently. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, but what he did is he listened to them. And so he kind of built the story around like the fact that they, what they, they got trapped in the ice. And he um, has them, the ice breaks up in the summer sometimes. And so and I think in the second summer, he had them re-rig and sail a little bit again before they got trapped. And lo and behold, like I think in 2017, they finally found the boats exactly where he said he'd written oh, wow. that they were in the book. But he just based it on 
was what the Inuits said. And they, they and they found them oh, with crazy. In, the, in the end the survey ships used local guides and looked where the local guides said that they were and they found them straight away really. Um, oh, but the story is that they're trapped in the ice, but there's this massive, preternaturally big um, polar bear hunting them as they're trapped on the ice. So, and the two ships are separated. So if you imagine they were sailing, they got trapped in the ice. They're separated by about a mile. So they, they have to get off the boats to go and communicate to each other. And, right. um, and but what really happens is like the, um, the polar bear is like a secondary horror because the real horror is how the men slowly um, degrade both physically and mentally and socially on the ships. And it gets worse and worse and worse as, it, as they get trapped for longer and longer and they get scurvy. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's just this amazing cast of characters like Dan Simmons' research was just off the chart good. But it's never like, it doesn't feel sometimes like, you know, when you read Moby Dick, you're a bit like, oh, there's another 10 pages about whaling. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> that kind of high school feeling, going, this is hard, man, right? Okay, uh... so they're, they're cutting out the ambergris now and now they're cutting, you know, five pages on how they like extract the blubber oh, um, yeah. and render it down. But he he kind of seamlessly weaves it all in, like details about how you know the can are, the cans that they used and how they could be corrupted with like mercury or with like painted meat and and the rats on the ship eating away the ice bodies and how they stored the bodies when they died and oh, all the people on it are like the actual manifest of people that were on the boat and stuff and he's just oh wow this is brilliant yeah there's this brilliant character called Doctor Goodsir who's gone out to study the, they called it the white bear. They didn't even call it a polar bear then because they'd heard about the white bear, but never studied it. And he's a kind of like botanist come doctor. And it it feeds into all those things like, you know, um, what was known at the time about like Darwin and evolution, which I think think the origin of the species was quite published, but Darwin's diaries from the Beagle were. Anyway, it links all in beautifully. And it's got like, such cool supernatural things it's just an epic book like and it's so readable it's, it's a big one i've got it on my shelves over there <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big old read but it's so good and the audio book is phenomenal like it's a real like master class in audio production as well like the Ooh. cast of characters and the voices and everything so good maybe one of the best bad guys ever as well in it yeah mr hickey who's like a guy, he's like a, a low-level, under-the-deck kind of sailor. <laughs> and he ends up being like, he's like a kind of real narky little man. And yeah, you know, <laughs> Okay, stop, yeah. stop making me want to read this story. <laughs> yeah. because I, I yeah. have other shit I have to finish first, <laughs> like the jam. <laughs> it says a lot about you as an author having these... Um, these other books and a lot sounds like a lot of different books and a lot of different authors that you've read mm-hmm. being able to go through all that and write I think it's it's probably it it shows that you're probably a very impressive so far author from what we've seen so far and it's it shows that you're the different because you have a lot of different exposures to different types of writing and stuff so you're mm-hmm. able to take that and kind of form your own style of writing mm-hmm. and your own version of it and I think it says a lot to you as an author yeah, it's, I mean, I hope, I hope so. I don't know if I'm any good, but you try. <laughs> so <laughs> far, so far, you do yeah, seem really you do seem that impressive. So I, 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 I aim for saying it. <laughs> I aim for I aim for reasonably competent. That's what I aim. For. <laughs> 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 Hopefully, I can get there. But yeah, for for sure, like I, I think you've always got to. One of the things I love to do is like you know read a book, but normally when I'm reading, I pick I try and like spot something that the writer does really well. Um, and probably be- much better than me and I try and like follow it through the whole book you know it might be how right. they do character you know character through dialogue or something or just the way they describe things um and actually I'm reading a non I've got a non-fiction book on audible at the moment and the guy is blowing me away with like how good a writer he is it's a non-fiction book called The Best Minds by Jonathan Rosen and it's um mm. It's it's a story, and he's just his descriptions are just amazing, and it's about his friendship with a with a man who um, uh, actually was schizophrenic, and um, 
and it was about like their friendship from boyhood through to adulthood and what happened and how the mental health system treated his friend and um all these things and how they grew up together but it's a lot of it is like i don't know if you've ever read king of the world the muhammad ali pulitzer prize um winning book i can't remember who wrote it but you get so much of like just like americana out of it like you 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 end up knowing loads about like the culture of the 60s in america for example or the 70s and right. so he links it into all this kind of stuff it's really fascinating but he's just such a sensitive you know writer just kind of captures things and just little observations that are just amazing so um, i'm gonna probably have to go back through and get the paperback and then underline things <laughs> and then like try them out try try and try and emulate it but i think you've got to do that if you're going to get better <laughs> yeah yeah i agree i mean i'm not much of an author I, i've only written two stories so <laughs> but i i can understand that's, what that's, you're saying that's how it starts brad doing it, <laughs> it yeah all starts i mean one or two stories and it grows i suppose so i i am very proud of my skinwalker in saskatchewan story I remember you sent you did send it to me and I, I kind of started yeah. it. I need to get back to it. Yeah. I've uh I've tried I have written a few um very short I, stories. Um but I I by no means think that I am anywhere near as good of a writer as you are. Uh I I feel like there's always room for improvement on things. Um I mm. I have a problem with I guess coming to um obstacles. As a writer, how how do you get over those obstacles? Is there an easy way for you or do you have any tricks that you try to do? You do mean with? what kind of obstacles would you mean, Mary? Like, like obstacles you, in the plot or obstacles that you put in the way of yourself? Uh I guess both. <laughs> um <laughs> because I, I've have it where like I'll come to I know usually when I try to think about a story, I try to think about it from Sometimes I'll go from where do I want this to go, but then the story will end up taking it in another direction, obviously. Sometimes the characters, mm. they end up writing themselves of what they want instead of what mm. I want, which mm. I've seen happen <laughs> a lot with stories. But um, I'll get to a plot point where I'm like, I don't know how to move on from this. And I think it's, I don't know if it's because yeah. I'm focusing on it too much or if you've, if you've had to deal with that same thing and how you kind of get over that. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one way to think about it is like, you know, fiction is all about obstacles because it's all about tension so if you're getting obstacles it's probably a good good thing like because if it's hard to get around you're like oh if i can work out a way to get around this it's cool <laughs> right I, my really thing is point. yeah if you don't have an obstacle you don't have tension whether that obstacle is like a difficult person or a physical obstacle or an event but you can sometimes write yourself into a corner but remember you're always allowed to write yourself back out of that corner <laughs> with the leap <laughs> and then go oh i won't have it quite like that um so, I mean, I remember Dan Brown had a great piece of advice, which was sometimes he what he would do is when he'd like written a character in a corner, he would, he would write in block capitals, go back and find a way to get Robert Langdon out of this room. <laughs> <laughs> Close bracket, skip to next scene <laughs> where he wants him to be. And then what he does is he goes back and he interviews like someone at the Louvre and goes, is there a back door into the Louvre? Or like, is there someone got a master key? And then he kind of can go back and fix the story. There's what, so there's, there's a little bit, it might be like a technical thing, like you need to think, think it through a little bit about where it's going to go. Some things mm -hmm. I tell people is like, what is good planning is good editing and vice versa, right? So some mm -hmm. people are planners and some people are um, pantsters, you know, <laughs> they're, 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 they're like free writers. But it doesn't really matter actually, because the kind of questions that someone who, is an editor, like say if you're editing something for structure and cohesion and making sense, how does the story work basically? They're the same kind of questions that you can ask if you're the kind of person that likes to plan. So it doesn't really matter when you ask them, as long as you ask them at some point and have answers for them, right? Okay. Um, so again, you've got to find like, what, are you more of a planner or are you more of a panster, like creative writer? If you're more of a creative writer, let's like write through or write maybe write multiple versions of the scene until you get one that you feel like, oh, that one inspires me. I always say like, try and write for you, the reader, not you, the writer, because you, the writer can sometimes be a bit 
we might be a bit narcissistic and self-indulgent. Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Understandable. <laughs> yeah, but by however you do it, by the end of it, you've got to write for you as the as the reader that needs to be impressed, right? So yeah, you could write multiple versions of the scene. I sometimes write a scene and go, no, I don't like it, delete it, write it again. Like it's not quite right, or I need to, like I'm writing a scene at, at the moment and I kind of wrote it one way where the character is, has just died, but he's not really dead. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, un, he's he's undead uh, yeah. uh and it, and i have him wake up kind of in purgatory and he goes through the worst scenes of his life um and i wrote it like that and thought mm, that's all right but what if i add the cat that's been annoying him for the first thirty thousand words and the cat kind of oh, turns up know. as a sarcastic spirit guide sitting on his chest and i thought oh that's, that's better cool. And I, then I went, actually love that idea. That's a great yeah. idea. <laughs> and then I thought, what happens if I cut that chapter completely? <laughs> but actually in the next chapter, have him wake up as an undead person with the cat in the real world sitting on his chest. But now he can telepathically talk to the cat and the cat can talk to him. Oh. And he's still as sarcastic as he thinks. It. So you see, I just kind of, kind of like, oh, I could maybe even, maybe I'm just backfilling this story so I know it. Does the reader need to know it? how does it work with the next scene so there's that element of it like you can just try it different ways because it doesn't you know it takes time but it you know you're just trying to get the best version of it that seems to to flow right. Right. another way to, another way to look at it is you've got sometimes people make a distinction between plot and character i tend not to i tend to think like you know um a plot is just usually a, an element of the external world that then affects the character and if you didn't have the two, it, you wouldn't really have a story. Mm -hmm. So right. like the, the external world, whether it's a, an event again or, or another person in the book, applies force in some way to that um, character. And they, they within, like you said, Mary, you know you're writing well if the characters start writing themselves. <laughs> and you wanted them to do certain things and they won't. Well, then you need to take that on board and think, okay, so what? how would my characters react if i did this to them <laughs> as, as god as god in this universe like where would right. it where would it where would it go or what do i need to do so i'm writing a book at the moment called across the dunes and i and and, and right and it's a very in, at heart it's a kind of a simple story it's it's kind of a retelling of a fairy tale from the point of view of what if the fairy tale was real or the legend cool. was real and it's this idea that every there's a local family that are kind of lords of the manor in a very british sense um, and every time they're called the Loromirs, and every time they return home, um, the eldest son, when he reaches his 16th summer, has to cross the dunes with his father, and they live on the coast, and they have to cross the dunes to get to the sea. You might think, oh, why? And there's a whole myth behind it that they have to renew the magic of this little town called Hernshaw um, for various reasons. Basically, there's two gods that have <laughs> been fighting. Okay. <laughs> uh, and one is, one is trapped in the dunes um and so the son has to basically cross the dunes or the father and son have to cross the dunes and it's a trial blah 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 so i always knew the basic story is the father and son come home the father and i kind of spice it up by saying the father doesn't know he's had a son he's always avoided having children because he thinks his father committed suicide when he was 16 and he can't really remember the myth like it's just it's just childhood stories yeah. it's not real right and this is part of the magic that literally they forget and the Loromirs go away. No one else can leave the town, but they can. And then they come back. But he assuaged having children. But then a week before, all his luck's gone because of the magic, right? And his property <laughs> deals are falling through. And so he knows he needs to sell the family home, which is this beautiful beach house and ruins and forest and everything and the village, the town. So he has to go home to sell this. And two days before he, or like a week before he has to go home, he discovers he has a son he didn't know he had. Oh, wow. Right. And it's because it, from a girlfriend previously who's just died and left him this son. And so he's like, oh, I never <laughs> thought I'd have a child. And then he come back not knowing any, not really believing anything of the myth. So I know how it starts. Right. And it ends, mm -hmm. obviously, with them. Both of them or one of them has to get across the dunes and survive. Yeah. The question is, is how I get, how do I get them from A to Z in an interesting way, 
right yes. and then that's where all the kind of world world building comes in and your antagonists and you know what your other protagonists would do and you know the logic of the, the story and stuff and how it plays into that so um yeah so that's one way like you, you your kind of blocks are like you've got to think about the mechanics of your story and how it fits together and you can think a lot about structure and stuff but fundamentally make sure there's tension in the scene like there's something that needs to be overcome or you're progressing the story in an interesting way. Sometimes scenes right. don't do a lot, but they add to, add to the reader's experience, right? As long as you're doing that, you're going to get to the end. The other one's much harder probably because the obstacles we put in the way of our own writing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, uh, you know, we, we, I always tell people if I'm, if I'm teaching writing and anything, I say like, you know, usually we are the biggest obstacles to our writing. Yes. Um, so yeah, um, heck, man. I mean, I, I think part of it is like um, fundamentally always just do it because you love it, right? And then have fun and just try and have fun well, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, I understand it's, that. Yeah, get, go in, do it, have fun. Like, it, and, it, and it's a different kind of fun, right? Because it's a maddening fun. It's a the whole point of it is it's supposed to be difficult because otherwise everyone would do it. And sometimes the writing flows, mm -hmm. but quite a lot of the time it's like it's more like an engineering problem that you've got to work out and you've it's a puzzle that you've got to solve. And you go, Oh, I've got it finally. I made it work. And there's a sense of satisfaction um because you made it work. Um other things that work around it's just like i always tell people you you've got to think about what you're like as an individual some people are really type a and they like everything being really really organized and laid out and other people are quite creative and freewheeling and i always think you've got to kind of got to work with what you've got right and so i tend to be i quite like structure and knowing where i'm going but i don't like to over plan um otherwise i feel like it stifles the fun of like finding yeah then you really have written yourself mm -hmm. into a corner yeah exactly so it's a, like a balance between those two and finding techniques to help you do that and again if you're a if you're kind of a more of a spontaneous writer what can be good but you tend to get lost is maybe just have a couple of reference points that you're trying to get to so it's a, a really good book called like writing your novel from the middle but it works for short stories right if you imagine the middle of the story is a hinge where kind of like there's usually like a, an expo you, know, you you tell a key piece of information or character has a key revelation um okay you might just think about that and then think about like well what would the inciting incident be and what would be my end as long as you've got a few reference points to kind of aim for that can be quite a good strategy as well um yeah and all the rest of it's like you need quiet to, you, need, you need singular focus to write yeah, it's yeah, very hard to yeah. 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 So however you get that is up to you. It's um it's quite difficult. Yeah. But the personal obstacles we put in the way, that's that's the that's the killer. <laughs> that is the killer for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think we're gonna wrap up the interview here. We like to keep it around an hour so that I can get it uploaded within a reasonable amount of time. Because like I said, I live in the middle of nowhere and it, it, my <laughs> internet is the absolute shits. <laughs> So I think we'll wrap it up now, if that's okay with you both. Um, Dan, you've been a fantastic guest. Thank you so much yes, for coming on have. the show. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure to chat to you. Nice to wait to yeah, see and you as well. And and now, since we're actually speaking and I can thank you properly, thank you so much for the book that you sent to me. Um, oh, it's my pleasure, mate. I, I was, it's, it's on my shelf. It's one of my prized possessions. I'm so glad oh. to own it. <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome mate that was great i was glad to send it to you awesome well thank you again for being on the show dan thank you mary for joining us as well oh yes thank you for having me and thank you for being on the show uh, that was that was incredible i appreciate all the advice and stuff that you gave as well and i'm really yeah, was... looking forward to reading this story and sending you messages about what i think is going to happen <laughs> absolutely <laughs> well, i look forward to that that's great guys Great. Thanks very much again, Dan. And thanks everybody for listening. And we'll see you next time on Pause and Listen.